Hey guys. Um, and to all our friends in Iran, Shabbatun Bechir, and I hope everyone's doing okay in the uh, mess over there. It's terrible and has been terrible for a long time, so. Inshallah, um, Hamishah Bechir, I mean, very, very soon. So, today's lesson of the day, other than uh, to overthrow the Iranian government, would be uh, about lifting and then how much you lift. So here's the question I got a lot today. So I got uh, lots of uh, questions repeatedly about how much are you going to lift. And the two areas of concern were the brows because people look so freaky after brow lifts. They're all worried about uh, what's going to happen if you do a brow lift because they see all the shitty brow lifts out there. And the lip lift, which... Uh, the main reason I want to talk about that is because people do ask me like how much are you going to lift and they try to do their own research and the research is misleading because uh, there are guidelines out there that were published on how long a lip should be written by people who had really only done like maybe 5, 10 lip lifts, 20 lip lifts, something like that, even 100, it's not a lot. So I don't think the guidelines are correct uh, with a few exceptions, but I'll go over that. And of course, the facelift. So those are the three deep plane lifts, is brow lifting, which is endoscopic, is a deep plane. Uh, lip lifting, there's a deep plane, and then face lifting, there's a deep plane. So I'll go over those. So brow lifts, if you do a brow lift correctly, it does not make you look like a freak. It doesn't do anything but take you back to where the things came from. Now, my favorite kind of brow lift is an endoscopic approach brow lift, meaning going into that deep plane over the bone, because that's the glide plane. So if you move stuff around, uh, you see how they, you know, it, it moves in this little plane on top of the bone and that's where it ages. And it doesn't age straight down, so you don't lift it straight up. That's the big misunderstanding I think a lot of surgeons have. And that's the problem with uh, designing a brow lift where you go and try to cut out skin and then, or maybe you do a release of just the skin and you pull it up, it doesn't go back to where it came from in those cases. You're designing it and you're making something that maybe never existed. The benefit of the endoscopic approach or endoscopic is that you just go release everything in front and behind and then you just grab the scalp and you move it back to where it was. And if you look at the medial brow, which is here, it usually goes down over time in the middle. So over there with your corrugators and your proceres. And when you lift it about 45 degrees out or so, following the superior temporal line, that's what gives you your medial brow lift. If you see that, that is a medial brow lift. You see how light the inside of my eyes got? So this is heavy, that's a medial brow lift. That's all it is. And, oh, Michael Voltaggio, hi, happy birthday. Everyone, it's Voltaggio's birthday. So, uh, well, it's tomorrow, but it's every day when it's Voltaggio, if you're that guy. So. This goes down laterally as well. You get temporal hooding and that comes up a little more vertical if you see that. So this is really the movement of brow aging. And I'll just show you over and over again so you understand, you understand where the direction of lift needs to be with these things. So when people ask, how much are you lifting on the brow? I tell them, I don't choose. I go release everything and it goes back to where it wants to be. And that's where the brow should have started on you years ago. And we just put it back to that. Now there's a few exceptions with, oh, everyone say happy birthday Voltaggio again. So there are a few exceptions with asymmetries where you do have to control it because uh, because they tend to pull out, you have to realize endoscopic brow lifting is meant to be bilateral. It's more effective bilateral because they pull against each other and you get this tension back to where the scalp should be rather than just veering somebody off to one side and lateralizing them. So, um, Fantastic. Hurry up and grab some dinner. Are you in LA right now or are you back home? All right, I'll call you. So uh, this is what the brow needs to do. You release it, you take it up. If it's unilateral, then you have to play with the asymmetry a little bit and you still have to do both sides by Esther. Uh, so that's that. Uh, as far as how much to lift, again, you don't choose. Now, if you're doing the other type of brow lifting, which is coronal brow lifting or uh, hemicoronal or anything like that, and you have to go all the way across, then yes, you have to design the brow and uh, in that case, you know, you show the person. But in my case, I would just tell them, listen, put your hand here, go like this, that's a brow lift. Now, facelift, how much do you choose? Don't you have to have me sitting up to know this? Do I have to be awake? Uh, the answer to that is no. 
you, the the way endoscope or deep plane facelifting is done is you just go release everything in the face again in this glide plane and you take it up to where it wants to go. So the question came today, well, what's the difference between that and vertical facelifting? What's the difference between that uh, and deep plane or masplication? So vertical facelifting is the direction a facelift goes because gravity goes in that direction. So uh, the only reason that's pertinent is because 20, 30 years ago, some people were pulling it this way or 45 degrees. They didn't really understand the vector. And it's because they weren't releasing the planes. They were just pulling on them and they had to choose a vector. Nowadays, if you do a deep plane, you release everything and it goes against where it came from, which is like a pendulum. It goes back up like this. So that's what you call a vertical lift. Gravity brought it down, facelift takes it up, vertical. That's all it means. Uh, as far as deep plane, that is the glide plane, which if you move things around, you'll see that this muscle underneath, which is the platysma, comes up to here. And this mass, it's not attached to the muscle underneath, which is your masseter or the sternocleidomastoid with the exception of the lateral part. They glide over each other. That glide plane where they slide is the deep plane. So you release that and you take it up to where it wants to go. You're not measuring how much to take. You're just going on the maximum on each side. And it's not like you take 20 millimeters on one side and 25 on the other. They both go to where they want to go because you don't age symmetrically. So you don't lift symmetrically. This doesn't happen. I told another patient today, your liver is here, your spleen is over there, your heart's twisted that way, your stomach goes this way. We are not symmetric beings. Not one part of us is symmetric. Faces are not symmetric. Our fusion lines are not symmetric. There's nothing symmetric about us. So you don't lift symmetrically. Now, lip lift. So here's the interesting thing that a lot of people don't understand. So, so there are no definitive guidelines on how long an upper lip should be or how much should be excised or how much should be uh, left remaining on one side versus the other, anything like that. So when designing uh, a lip lift, I look at the mouth first and I first look at the overall appearance of the face. So to look at balance and I imagine, just like I saw a girl today who was asking me about a lip lift, she said, can I do a lip lift because it feels like it's long and I don't have enough eversion. And I said to them, um, I said to her that, no, you can't because there'd be an imbalance with your chin. So she had a slightly taller chin uh, and perfectly balanced lip for her chin. But if I were to shorten her lip, it would look worse. So uh, decided not to do that for her, for example. So first you look at the ratios of the whole face and see what would look good. And this is general taste. You have to have good taste to just understand these things. The other thing that I was looking at is mouth closure. So. Uh, the amount of tooth show is not super relevant if you have poor mouth closure. So if you look at somebody who's straining to close their mouth like that all the time, you can't really lift their upper lip away from their lower lip anymore because they're gonna have trouble closing. So that's the number one thing you're looking at is proper mouth closure. And this is really what dentists should be looking at too, cosmetic dentists when they're doing veneers and caps and uh, that kind of stuff. They have to see how comfortable the mouth closes. If it closes like this, Okay, you can afford to mess around with the teeth a little bit. If it's already straining, then you're gonna add longer teeth or more projected teeth, they're gonna have even more trouble closing their mouths and they're gonna age faster with depression around the sides, their chin starts rising higher and their neck starts drooping. So all this stuff happens with poor mouth closure. So that's the number one thing I'm looking at uh, as far as dental display or tooth display or lifting goes. Then I say, okay, if they have comfortable mouth closure, where do I, how much teeth do I wanna show? And this is more of a side effect than the primary goal for most cases because I don't choose exactly where I want it to go. I uh, Iatrogenically, meaning during surgery, you can't change the tooth show as much as uh, someone would naturally have. So naturally, someone can have uh, anywhere from, they say two to four millimeters is good, but realistically, anywhere from one to eight, you could have eight millimeter tooth show naturally and you could be fine and have a good mouth closure depending on the way your anatomy is and how your mouth closes. Uh, hi, Dr. Kashani, Isaac. So um, it really just depends on how that individual's mouth closes. Uh, if you're doing a lip lift, however, you cannot go over four millimeters of tooth show. You're gonna cause massive problems with mouth closure. And again, early depression around the sides, your chin starts to go higher with age and the neck starts to droop faster. So these things are all a consequence of poor or strained mouth closure. Same with resting bitch face, that all is categorized and podo orange, the pebbling in the chin. These are all categorized in the same boat of uh, poor mouth closure and strained mouth closure. So there is no 
perfect, incisive display for a patient. It's whatever you can get away with without causing a problem, and you don't wanna go over four because that'll cause a problem. So anywhere from zero to four is good. Now, I've taken people from negative seven to zero. Okay, it's not showing teeth, but it's not negative seven where you're hooding over the lower tooth like this. So that's still an improvement in the right direction. As far as excision heights, the excision heights for a lip lift, I have published about saying it's usually between four to 11 millimeters of excision. Now less can be done, but why do a lip lift for less than four millimeters? It doesn't make a big enough difference and you're gonna go through all this healing. It's not really worth it. Uh, the exception would be for a scar revision or for a laterally biased lift where essentially, okay, fine, it could be three, but then laterally you're five or six. Now we're talking, you can get like a nice change that way. The research I've been doing uh, has shown me that I know nothing about the amount of incisive display I'm gonna end up with. And I, I have realized this because I've been measuring the incisive display that I get with different types of procedures, whether it's the deep plane lip lift or the muscle suspension or nasal base suspension. And what you see is that there are so many factors involved, including skin quality and the elasticity of skin that it's almost impossible to predict. But it does help with guidelines saying if you have a thin skin white person with big teeth, they're gonna get a massive change uh, per millimeter removed versus uh, someone who's black or Asian or hyperelastic, thicker, doughy skin with smaller teeth, they're gonna get a much smaller change for let's say eight millimeters removed, you'll get like a one millimeter gain in tooth show. So um, there's a, a lot of factors that are involved there. Now, how long should an upper lip be? The misconception out there is that there's an amount. There is no amount. The only amount that is important is that you shouldn't really go less than 11. Maybe you can go to 10 and a Russian patient who has the architecture for it and has uh, you know, 200 years of um, ancestors who had short upper lips and it kind of fits, that, fine, you can go there. But less than 11 millimeters in general, it's gonna be a little difficult for people to smile because the orbicularis is a contracting muscle that pulls against the teeth and squeezes against the teeth. And if you have it confined into a little 10, 11 millimeter space or less than that, it can't constrict any more than it already is. So your smile gets really limited at that point. Um, the excision height maximum is also 11 millimeters, which means you should never take more than 11 millimeters on somebody in one surgery away because you're not gonna be able to redistribute the skin properly without bunching and causing problems. So 11 is a good number to know. Beyond that, there is no definitive. So uh, I've left lips 20 millimeters long in the middle because that's what fit the patient. So 20, 22, 24, like that as you measure as you go out. And I've done that on plenty of patients, 17, 19, 21. I've done different measurements. So there is no number. You just have to make it match the face and make sure you're not exaggerating any of the architecture, which is another big problem with lip lifts is that you can exaggerate architecture. You can exaggerate the cupid's bow trough and peaks. You can exaggerate the downturn when you lift too far centrally, you can exaggerate the resting bitch face, you can exaggerate all these things. And every bit of this has to go into your negotiation when you're looking at somebody and say, how much am I going to remove? So when a patient asks me, how much am I going to remove? I sometimes say, okay, listen, I'm probably gonna remove like five millimeters. This is kind of what it'll look like. Most of the time I say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to figure it out that day because I have to measure it out on you. And my measurements will help me figure it out. And doing the um, looking at your mouth and how it functions that day after we remove the filler that you have, if it's excessive, that'll help me figure it out. So um, can you show me doctor how it's gonna look afterwards? And the answer to that is always no. A rhinoplasty, maybe you can show someone there's a bump, there's no bump, fine. With lip lifts, facelifts, brow lifts, you cannot show what it's gonna look like. I just say, listen, just browse the website. If you see anybody who looks like you, assume maybe it'll look like that, but it probably won't look like that. Uh, I tell them there is no way to know, even if I were to tell you, even if I were to show you a picture, there is no way to know. The only way you can really have faith in how your outcome is gonna be is to know that wherever you are now, I'm gonna take you here. And I'm good at taking people here. I'm not, I'm not good at telling them exactly what that's gonna be because there's no way to really paint the picture. So I um, hope that answers everything. Again, hope everyone in, well, around the world is fine, but specifically in, Iran, I hope everyone's okay. I haven't heard much from friends over there, um, but hope everything's fine and something fixes itself very, very soon. So everyone, good luck in Iran. Inshallah, how much is like, Zutam Bishe, I would say. Sorry, my Farsi is like a five-year-old, but um, everyone else have a good 
Night, because I'm out of here.